Thank you so much, uh, Donnie. We'll check up, uh, I think, uh, one more time before the day is out with another carry update with those guys. Right now, we're going to uh, welcome Mike Bowden, Distal, Head of Intermodal Solutions here at Freight Waves. Uh, what's going on, my friend? Not much. Good to see you guys. A lot of interesting stuff um, earlier from Joanna Marsh on um, yeah. the, that house bill. Um, yeah, it, it really it, it does, is. It Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it does, it does seem, uh, you know, unfair that uh, the shippers, you get charged with demurrage um, in, in, in so many things that they're, they're outside of their control. You know, things like when they, um, you know, the facilities aren't, you know, open or or things of that nature. We're, we're just sort of outside of the, the shippers control, where, whereas with the railroads are late and those uh, companies can't get products to market, that there's no credit, that there's not sort of an equivalent demerge charge. I think that's sort of the point that those um, congressmen were, were making, which seems to be a valid one. Yeah, it really does. And what I, I didn't understand either was, uh, which is interesting to me, is that many of those railway assets are actually owned by those shippers as well. So not only is the cargo in there theirs, it's their rail car and they can't get it and they're getting charged for it to be there. I, I don't understand that. Anyway, yeah, it seems like a valid point to me as well. Yeah, that's right. So they're they're generally leasing those cars. So the more specific the freight cargo, the more likely that the shipper would either own that car or if it's uh, or, or lease that car from a big leasing company like a like a GATX or a Trinity. Mm -hmm. And so if it's if it's delayed, that's just one extra cost where those cars aren't aren't being turned. So it just really sort of adds another layer of um, you know validity to the shippers' concerns that um, you know really they should be getting you know credit there. Yeah, absolutely, and Mike. When you're looking at this, do you think this has a good chance of passing how it is? You know, I don't know enough about the policy and the inner works of Washington D.C. to to see you know how exactly that. Um, you know, the chance of that um, you know passing. I mean, what it does seem like to me is that there's not a lot of sympathy in Congress for the railroads. It seems like, you know, you have a bipartisan group of uh, senators and congressmen, you know, really upset with the rail service, particularly those from the agriculture states. And now you have this group of, uh, you know, Democratic uh, congressmen that are, you know, are upset about, um, you know, the, the service also, then, then also these the demerge charges and want to expand the uh, scope of the STB, or at least the, the power of the STB, which is, a, a, has been a, a criticism. You know, there's been this criticism that the Surface Transportation Board, which, you know, economically regulates the railroads, is sort of a paper agency where it's not really regulating the the, the, the railroads because the um, you know they they make a decision and it sort of has to be sort of challenged in the courts. And I think um, you know those on the shipper side of things would like to have see the STB have more power. Um, and, you know, certainly when you have someone like, you know, Marty Oberman, who's the, you know, the chairman of the STB, really has been pretty vocal about um, the fact that the service has been awful and, you know, wants to, it seems like he wants to do more to make it, um, you know, to just make things a little bit, you know, better situation for, for, for shippers. Um, I think giving the Surface Transportation Board more power uh, would be a boon for, for shippers, potentially negative for railroads. Yeah. Mike, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about, I mean, still railroads, but let's talk about uh, the negotiations that are going on right now. And and really the the, the difficulty in recruiting, uh, hiring uh, people, employees into those railroads. I know there's, there's some that would imply implications, right or wrong, I don't know. You're the expert. I suppose you would know that railroads really did a lot of that to themselves with the uh, precision railroading and longer trains, et cetera, like uh, making it less attractive for people to stay or to, to uh, come into the railroads. What's your thought on that and what's going on with the negotiations and how is that impacting the railroads? Yeah, so I think there's no question that railroad employees have been asked to do more with with fewer people. And I think the fact that the railroads are having difficulty hiring and retaining employees uh, suggests that the market is telling us that either they're not getting paid enough or they're not uh, or it's a job is too demanding or they're not getting paid enough for how demanding the job is. So that seems to be what the what, what the market is is telling us and so it does seem like the railroad employees are in a pretty good you know position here um in, in the negotiation which you know may get you know dragged out until mid 
you know, September when potentially they could strike and then the congressman uh, would, would order them, you know, back to work, you know, quickly. Um, and that's, you know, I think uh, sort of a valid argument, but there's also a valid argument that's just, this is a, an unusual time for the labor market and the industrial uh, skilled labor market has been extremely tight. And there's just been a lots of opportunities for these workers to have jobs that are more attractive where they get home every night, you know, a lot of things in construction. I mean, you would think that interest rates rising as much as they have would slow the construction um, uh, activity and, and that would, you know, loosen up the, the market for um, skilled industrial labor. Then maybe some of the, the, the guys would come back to, 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 to work on the railroad. But it's, it's interesting that this has been so different than other periods where the railroads usually have been able to hire these employees back whenever they needed them just because they they, they paid more um, but it does seem like uh, sort of reached a tipping point um, you know as you say that you know, the job is more demanding than it used to be with the with precision railroading I mean they can also look at the trajectory of railroad em employment and see that that's a downward you know trajectory so if you're new to the industry and think well you know, this is something I want to do for the rest of my career joining a, an industry that has a ever declining number of, of workers doesn't seem like a good one to go into. And Mike, when you look at this industry and this segment and hiring in particularly, do you see the union being any type of an obstacle right now with trying to recruit more employees into this area? The union being an obstacle? Um, I mean, I think the fact that these are unionized jobs, they have good benefits, um, you know, is, is really helps, uh, you know, recruiting. I mean, I think that's part of what, uh, you know, the reason why you would join the, the, the railroad. I mean, there's not a lot of union jobs out there. These are good jobs, good benefits. Um, but I would say the union really, it hasn't been maybe all that effective in having a consistent level of you know, employees. I mean, the railroads seem to be able to flex up, mm -hmm. flex down their, their their workforce as 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 volumes change. But I think, sort of, the hill that the unions are going to die on is the um, you know two man crews. Uh, they're not going to put up with going to one man crews. That's going to take maybe an act of Congress for for that to to happen. Literally, right? Uh, and uh, so, okay, so you, you have the argument about automation to to automate or not to automate, right? I mean, cannot the argument be made by the railroads that, okay, if it's too demanding now and too dangerous or whatever it happens to be, and that's why we can't recruit and that's why you need more money, here's the automation we were going to make your job easier, <laughs> right? Can that argument not be there? Or is that just, it's just, is that still a major sticking point? They want to avoid that automation and they want basically shorter tra trains and uh, two-man crews at least, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different ways that the railroads are being automated. I mean, w one way that, you know, really would enhance safety would be things like inspecting the track and, and, and things of that nature in terms of like preventative, you know, type maintenance, which a lot of those things can be done via infrared sensors and various sensors that you might not pick up on if just a, a human eyeball is inspecting those things. And that can prevent derailments. And that's the type of thing where just if you don't have... Um, you know, technolo technological advancements, you're just in inhibiting improvements in, in, in safety. You know, the, the, the two-man crew situation, I, you know, I can sort of see the argument both ways. I can see it, well, maybe you don't need it because there have been these advancements in safety with positive train control. On the other hand, if there's something like a train separation, it's, you know, it's really a lot less efficient to only have one, a one-man crew. You'd need to get someone, you know, from another from another crew. So th there, there can be situations where, you know, a two-man crew, I think, is still, is, is still beneficial. So maybe it depends on the, um, you know, the function. Yeah. Excellent, Mike. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And, of course, you can also be found with Stockout. Can you give us a little bit of information about that? Sure. So the Stockout is newsletter we put out uh, twice a week. There's also a podcast on Monday afternoon at two o'clock uh, Eastern, where I go through just what's happening in the CPG industry and relate that to 
the data that we're seeing in uh, freight waves, uh, you know, sonar and, uh, you know, a lot going on this, the CPG industry, they're trying to hang on to their, you know, customers while they raise prices in some cases up mm. to 15% and hope that, uh, consumers uh, behavior doesn't change too much with those steep price increases. I think it's the, sort of the main thing that's going on there. You know, they, have, they sort of have to do that in order to preserve margins because their costs have, have increased uh, really across the board. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, how the uh, consumer has not really felt the full impact of inflation yet. Exactly right. It's exactly kind right. of scary. Thank you so much, Michael. Everybody check his stuff out. Very, very interesting and insightful. Have a wonderful day, Michael. Okay, you too. Good to see you guys.